The quote for today is, the buttons on my jeans have started social distancing themselves from each other. <laughs> I like the story that Bob Hope told when he was doing a charity event at a nursing home. After he did his comedy routine, he walked up to this elderly 90-year-old lady and said, hello, ma'am, do you know who I am? And the elderly lady says, no, Sonny, but if you ask the nurse, she could tell you. <laughs> In today's gospel, Jesus says, who do the crowds say that I am? Let's take a look at this passage, short passage from Matthew chapter 16, one of the most important passages for us as Catholics, because here we have Jesus changing Simon's name from Simon to Peter, then, and Jesus would build his church upon St. Peter and establish the Catholic Church. Peter is the first bishop of Rome, would become the first bishop of Rome and the first pope. But where does all this take place? Scripture says, in an area called Caesarea Philippi. Now, why would Jesus take his apostles 30 miles north into pagan territory away from the Sea of Galilee? Again, it's 30 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. Why would he take him to this region of Caesarea Philippi? Jesus never did anything by accident. Everything was on purpose, was deliberate. And he took them to this region, which had a huge rock formation. You can go there today on trips to the Holy Land. And this rock formation is about 200 feet tall, a cliff, and about 600 feet wide. And in the Lord's time, it was a pagan area where they had temples dedicated to the god Pan, P-A-N, and, and other pagan temples. And in fact, um, King Herod had actually built a temple in honor of Caesar Augustus and named the city Caesarea after Caesar Augustus. But then, after Herod's death, his four sons got territories divided up for them, and his son Philip became the tetrarch of that area. And that's why it, it's called Caesarea Philippi, after Caesar Augustus and after Philip, the son of King Herod. And again, it was an area of paganism. And at the base of this huge cliff rock formation was what they called the jaws of death or the gates of hell, this huge pit. Some of them thought it was like a bottomless pit. Some thought it was actually the, the gates of hell. So the Lord takes them to the base of this huge rock formation, which had a pagan temple, and notice what he'll say. He says, you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. Again, that's the sort of the background. You can go there today and see some of the remains of the pagan temples, and of course, see this rock formation and this large pit at the base of the rock formation. So the Lord says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Jesus always referred to himself as the Son of Man, the title from Daniel referring to himself, to the Messiah. So Jesus here does the first Gallup poll in history. You know, who do the crowds say that I am? And now here we have the results of the poll. 33.5% say, Lord, you are John the Baptist, come back from the dead, that the spirit of John the Baptist now resides in you. After King Herod killed John, his spirit is now in you. Another 33% Lord say that you're Elijah, because of course they had the, all the Jews knew that Elijah had to come before the Messiah, because the Elijah figure was John the Baptist. And still others say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Notice that the crowds got it wrong, that nobody got it right. And then Jesus turns to them and says, now who do you say that I am? And the word you hear is plural. Who do you as apostles say that I am? and there is dead silence. And then one voice rings out, and that is the voice of Simon. And he says something that is so powerful, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And of course the word Christ is, uh, in Greek, Christos is, means the anointed one, the Messiah, and the son of the living God. What an insight. And even Jesus says to him after Peter declares his faith in Christ, that Christ is truly the son of the living God, Jesus responds, 
you are truly blessed. You're truly favored by God, Simon, son of Jonah. He uses his full name, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. In other words, Peter, you are not bright enough to have come up with that on your own, is basically what he was saying, which is very true. St. Peter never says the right thing in almost anywhere in, in the Gospels. It was my heavenly Father that revealed this to you. It was a divine revelation. You were inspired by the Holy Spirit, inspired by God to know this truth that yes, I am the Christ, the anointed one, the son of the living God. And so because you have declared this to me, I now declare something to you. So Jesus says, now I say to you, you are Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church. Now Jesus spoke Aramaic and in Aramaic, the word is kepha, K-E-P-H-A. You are kepha, and upon this kepha, I will build my church. Again, remember the backdrop of the pagan temple, the huge rock formation. And now he changes Simon's name to Peter. Now, when God changes somebody's name, it means they have a brand new mission. Think of Abram to Abraham. And eventually Saul would become, you know, Paul of Tarsus. But here we have Jesus naming this man Simon, the fisherman, the word Simon in Hebrew means like a reed that can sway in the wind. He changes his name to rock, to Peter. And even today we have, you know, about what, seven or eight Rocky movies, right? There's a fellow named Rocky, Philadelphia boxer. And so, and then you think of Dwayne Johnson, right? What do they call him? They call him the rock. So it's not uncommon that someone like Dwayne Johnson could have a nickname, the rock. So Jesus changes his name from Simon to Peter, and he says, you are Peter upon this rock, I will build my church. And then he says, the gates of the netherworld, the jaws of death, the gates of hell, shall not prevail against the church. So the church can never be destroyed. It's one holy Catholic apostolic, it will last until the second coming of Christ. Even though countless people have tried to destroy the church, Nero tried to destroy the church, Julian the Apostate, Napoleon tried to destroy the church, the French revolutionaries, the communists, Nazis, everybody tries to destroy the church. In fact, Napoleon once said, I shall destroy the Roman Catholic Church. And one of the cardinals said to him, your majesty, if popes, cardinals, bishops, and priests have not succeeded in destroying the church in the course of 19 centuries, how do you expect to do it in your lifetime? An actual quote. So we cannot destroy the church. It'll be here until the second coming of Christ, until the end of time. And then he says, and I will give you, Peter, singular, the word you hear is singular, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. We heard in that first reading that the king always had a prime minister and he gave the keys of the kingdom to the prime minister when he went away as a sign of authority. If you give somebody the keys to your house, the keys to your car, you're giving them you know, authority to enter your house or to drive your car. The keys of the kingdom is very important when you compare it to the Old Testament. And so Jesus now gives Peter that authority as he will establish him as the first bishop of Rome, the first leader of the church, the first pope, that whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That is the Lord's authority that he gives to the Holy Father, to the Pope, when he speaks on issues of faith and morals. Again, it has to be on issues of faith and morals, and it has to be when he's speaking as the head of the church. Now, a Pope can say something, you know, on, a, on an airplane or on a bus or in front of a reporter off the cuff. Those are not infallible statements. Those are his personal opinions about things. It's only when he's speaking as Pope, as the lead, head, head of the church, on an issue of faith or an issue of morals, that he's protected from teaching error as Pope. And so, for example, we'll see next Sunday in the Gospel what Peter does when he's not speaking infallibly. When Jesus says, hey, I'm going to Jerusalem to be crucified, Peter says, no, Lord, God forbid that ever happened to you. What does Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan because you're speaking not as, you're thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. So that's an example next Sunday 
of St. Peter speaking personally of his own personal opinion, not inspired by God like he was today in this divine revelation of Christ, the Son of the living God. So then the gospel concludes by Jesus strictly ordering his disciples not yet to reveal that he was the Christ. Eventually they would reveal to everyone at Pentecost that Jesus is the Messiah, he is the Son of God, he is the Christ, but not yet. It was not yet time for this to be revealed. So when we take this gospel and think about it, the Lord asks each one of us a question. Who do people say that I am? But then he asks us individually, who do you say that I am? And the correct answer is what Simon Peter said. And that's what we have to say in our hearts as well, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is our Lord, our Savior. And not only do we have to believe the proper doctrine about Christ, that he is truly the Son of God, but we have to accept him into our heart and soul as our Lord, as our Savior, to give our whole life to Christ. And of course, we have the privilege of receiving Jesus in a few moments in Holy Communion. So that is who Jesus is. And the Lord asks each one of us individually to answer that question in our own heart, to profess our faith in Jesus Christ. And we will do that now by reciting our creed.